relieved. I mean, there's, there's been pain ever since that last play. I mentioned it during the week. Like, I felt that all the time. Like, every time I was in the gym, I felt that. I mean, Christian Lego and I, before this game, we were just sitting in the locker room, heads down. All we were thinking about was that last play. They're a great team, we're going to definitely see them again, but I mean, right now it's just release of pressure, you know, we were 0-4 against them, like, in Darien history, and to get that one against a great team, that's, that feels great. Hello everybody, and welcome once again to The Meat Grinder, your weekly dose of high school football in Connecticut, and I'm your host, Sean Patrick Bowley, and with me as always is Peter Bagaga. Peter, how are you? Good, good. Still still coming down from quite a weekend of football. Yeah, before we start at the top of the show, you heard a little bit from, uh, well, the game of the week, the game of the year, so to speak, uh, Darien defeating Newtown 27-14, to 14, uh, a game that was nip and tuck the entire way until Darien, Ty Kamiski, the big fella, my lacrosse face of Fogo guy for Darien lacrosse coming through with some, with some punishing running and the blue wave, I uh, get some, some measure of revenge on uh, Newtown, even though it's two years ago now. Uh, but that, hey, listen, that was a big, big result. We'll talk a little bit about that later with Jeff Jacobs, who was there on the scene. We both were not. And, uh, you know, I was following a bit on Twitter, but there was carnage elsewhere all over the state. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a, it was just a it was a fascinating week. And I threw out my top 10 ballot and started all over again. I basically burned it and uh, started all over Pete. Yeah, I uh, kind of did the same thing. I uh, <laughs> when I was putting together my ballot uh, on Sunday night, I just didn't even look at my old one. Nope. Like I didn't care where I had anyone else. I didn't care who I had at number one, number two, number three. I've seen enough of these teams to start the season, not all of them, but enough of them to where I just threw it out. And I was like, all right, here's my first official ballot of the season. This is where I think I'm going to go from my starting point unless next week is chaos. And then I just throw it out again and start all over. But I, I think I voted for about seven new teams. I think that's basically how I did it. You know, some teams I, I, I had my top one. I mean, I voted for Newtown to start the year. Number one, just because, you know, I thought they would, you know, could you have had me put Darian there? Sure. And I figure they're going to play anyway very early. So we can figure that out. I now vote for Darien number one. Uh, but elsewhere, it was like, let's take a look at some of these scores here from the from the alliance. It was just a, it was a crazy week. You know, the alliance for the uninitiated is basically a crossover between the SEC, FCAC, SWC, ECC, and now the CCC. And uh, let's quickly break it down here. There were 24 games overall. A few got postponed because of COVID and uh, half of them. Four, actually, a little bit more than half of them, 14, were decided by more than 14 points. And those were the, the big, despite what you might think, those are the big results from this week. Uh, more than 14 points, including uh, Shelton beating up on number four Greenwich, 35 to 14. That was uh, obviously one that, well, Shelton wasn't ranked and Greenwich was number four. So, uh, you know, I saw Shelton last week. I thought their offense was really suspect. They barely put him anyway. They only scored 14 points. I thought the defense played well, but against a team like Greenwich, I figure Shelton for dead. Shelton just pounded the rock. We'll talk to Mike DeFelice, the Shelton coach, a little bit about that game later, but that was a shocking result, Pete. That was the biggest, most surprising result of the night. Not that Shelton won, but by how much they won by, how dominant they, they, they were on the line of scrimmage to rush for 322 yards. Oof. That said, looking back on it, Greenwich allowed 20 points in their first seven quarters of the season. Since yeah. the fourth quarter against Ridgefield in their second game, they've allowed 55 points in the last five quarters. Wow. That's, that's interesting. That's suspect. We're going to talk a little bit more about Ridgefield uh, going forward, but Greenwich, something's going on in Greenwich. They're, that de- they're, they're leaking. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, their schedule is not going to be kind to them the rest of the way. So they need to figure it out quick. So that was that was one game. Another game that I thought was very interesting was the game that you went to, you know, Ridgefield, a team that you were really high on because of the way they came back against Greenwich, really sticking it to Xavier on their own. Not exactly their own uh, 
their own turf. Their turf is ripped up. So they played the next the auxiliary practice field next door. Pete, what was the atmosphere like and what happened? The atmosphere was awesome. Let's just like I got there. I was told, bring bring your lawn chairs because there's you know, they have like one set of bleachers. It's kind of small. Uh, It's a it's a turf field like it's a you know, it's better than most teams fields in the state. Um, But they had like a really small scoreboard. It didn't have downs on it. Um, The PA guy uh, will give this person credit. Uh, He did some of the things I don't really like uh, PA people doing, but. He uh, he kept everyone updated with the downs and stuff, which was really helpful for me. Yeah. But the fans were in the, uh, the the end zone closest to the school. They were up a hill. Uh, it looked really cool. Uh, they really made the most of it. Uh, and then obviously on the field, Ch- uh, Ridgefield just was awesome. Justin Keller, I think I said this to you on Saturday. Justin Keller is the best quarterback that I've seen this year. And I've been looking at the stats on Max Preps, and I know – Not every team uses Mac preps. It's not super updated. Uh, Even after last week, some team have stats in from week three, some don't. But he's been the most impressive quarterback I've seen. He's got seven passing touchdowns, another one on the ground. He's a dual threat. He's a junior. So he's really only played three varsity games. And, you know, Coach, Coach Callahan said to me after the game, like the Greenwich game, the beginning, you could tell he was tight. He was nervous. He maybe, you know, didn't make the decisions that he would normally play. And then as the game went on against Greenwich, he started to loosen up. And he took that loose mentality into Xavier. And it wasn't even the passing touchdown. They were great. Don't get me wrong. But the way he extended plays with his legs when Xavier was getting in the backfield, he'd roll out, move away, throw a dart on the run. Coach Callahan said he was dangerous for defenses. He is. I mean, he... He's the most impressive player that I've seen so far this year. Yeah, no, I haven't seen him yet, but you were raving about him last time. 28, seven over Xavier. Now we were all over Xavier at the beginning of the year. You had Drew Chrome and then DJ, right? I mean, it was just, but uh, that's a, that's about to be a tough result. How did Andy take it afterward? Andy, Gale? Yeah, Andy was Andy. You know, he said, uh, you know, the team didn't make the plays. Uh, he goes, Richfield made plays. They made the big plays. We didn't. And he was right. I mean, there were some, Really good passes that Drew made that were dropped, um, you know, to extend drives. They, you know, Ridgefield was converting on third down early. I I think uh, the first two touchdown drives, uh, Ridgefield converted on third and long like two or three times. And then, you know, for Xavier, they'd get into a third and long or a third and short and couldn't convert. And Xavier had their chances. Ridgefield missed a 25-yarder to go up 10-0. Xavier went four and out. They got the ball down to the red zone, couldn't score. So they had their chances. They just didn't convert. Uh, I think they're, you know, they're not happy at Xavier right right now. No. And, um, you know, we'll see. How, how do you recover from that? You know, that's a big thing is how, you could tell how good your team's going to be when you recover after a game like that. <laughs> well, they got St. Joseph coming to their house this weekend, this Saturday, which uh, no rest for the weary for Xavier. Um, so that's going to be a fascinating game, you know, a, kind of a turning point here very early. We're only week four going to be a turning point here for Xavier and or St. Joseph. I mean, St. Joseph beat up on Windsor in a game uh, I thought was, uh, you know, I wasn't too shocked that given the way St. Joe's played against Staples and the like. But I thought Windsor, which I voted the top 15 to start the season, would put up a little bit more of a fight. But <laughs> what can you say about St. Joe and Maxwell Warren? Five catches, 184 yards, three touchdowns. He was all over the field. And Windsor didn't have a chance. You know, it's funny. I went to the first game against Danbury, and I asked the assistant coach, I was like, hey, do you guys have a roster? And they're like, our rosters are on the website, and they're correct. And I was like, oh, (laughs) awesome. Thank you so much. First touchdown of the game is to number five. I'm looking at the roster. I'm like, where is he? And, of course, Maxwell Warren is not on the CIAC roster or wasn't at the time. He wasn't there week two either. So I don't know if they were hiding him or something, but, man, he can ball. He's a great wide receiver. He, you know, him and Morrissey have this connection, and uh, it's working. I mean, you know, he's following those footsteps of Brady Hutcherson, Will Diamantis, you know, Jared Mazzoni, I believe, uh, the wide receiver from, you know, years back. Like, they got guys, Malazi. And, uh, you know, he's got – he's just another great – Great receiver at St. Joe's. Only guy back who has any experience. And, you know, he's their go-to guy right now, and he's making the most of it. That's a big win for St. Joe going all the way up to Windsor and winning that one. But Another game that comes. Xavier, kind of- just quickly, they're going to have Xavier at 7 o'clock on Saturday night. Yeah. That is a huge time difference from a normal week. Even if you play Saturday, 7 o'clock on a Saturday, they're going to Xavier. 
which if you haven't been, I know you've been to the field at Xavier. I've been to, you know, they can get packed out and that fan group at Xavier could be interesting, but you know, St. Joe's is rolling. So get your tickets now. Really not another big lines matchup. Another game that kind of popped off the stat sheet was Christian Russo. Once again, at Cheshire Barry, remember how big a deal uh, Ch- Staples was at the beginning of the year, beating Trumbull like that in the last second play. Cheshire completely just completely wipes Staples off the map. Christian Russo, I mean, sheets running for 250 yards, just absolutely obliterating the FCAC in that game. 42 to 14 Cheshire for Staples. Cheshire. Uh, goodbye, Staples. We'll see you in a few uh, few weeks, if that. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that was another uh, fascinating game. Yeah, Christian Russo, uh, talk about a kid with experience, right? Started as a freshman at Cheshire. Uh, finally getting the chance to be, you know, the workhorse back for the Rams and 610 yards in three games, six touchdowns. He does it defensively too. I mean, if the Rams are just going to ride him the rest of the way, I, I don't think that would be a bad idea. I mean, the kid is, he's a stud. Other games that kind of popped off was massive, absolutely obliterating Hill House. Third straight road game for the, uh, for the Panthers. It's Steve Christie starts off three and oh, that's not no big. You look at it, you're like, Benell, eh, Stratford, eh, but Stratford just won their game. And it looks like they got some players. Stratford, a shout out to Nathan Tyler for winning their first, uh, very first game. Another shocker. Law was undefeated. They beat them. Massick comes all the way to New Haven. The kids have no idea what I mean by go to modern. He's called <laughs> Pete. Steve Christie's calling me up and going, going, Sean, what are you talking about? And this is what I'm talking I'm like, come on, modern pizza. Come on, Steve. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All kids, don't, they don't know that. I'm like, yeah, that's the whole point. I tell you guys to go to modern. You know, I, I'm kind of insinuating that it might be a pleasure cruise for uh, for Massick. And sure enough, listen, Nick Saku, he's been screaming for our attention all season long. Look at us. You left me off the uh, you left me off the with the was he even on the top 25 list. He might have been I think 25 so. to watch on 25, 25 to watch 25 to watch. Was he on it? I forget. I, I, I forget that list. Uh, he might have been. I think he was, but he was certainly left off the, the top performers list. They're all screaming at Steve. Christie's sending me his stats every every night, like clockwork. One o'clock. Here's his stats of the latest one. Absolutely just obliterated um, Hill House in that game. Let me just quickly find the stats for you here. Uh, he h- threw for 151 yards and three touchdowns, ran for another 150 yards and three touchdowns. He's got his brother Ryan in there. And uh, Massick, a lot of people were not sold on Steve Christie as head coach. Look at that. Massick crushing Hill House, a team that took Fairfield prep, which is ranked, uh, you know, to the limit. Prep needed some block punts to win that game. And Massick made no doubt about who was better in that game. 53 to 14 on the night. Sadly, we remembered uh, Floyd Little, the great Floyd Little, you know, the guy whose name's on the building. His widow came up to talk. I actually got to meet them the end of 2019, and I actually got my picture taken with the great Floyd Little, who is, I may add, a Syracuse guy. Go Orange. And uh, it was great to, you know, get to meet him. And sadly, he passed away from, uh, from cancer this, uh, this past year. And, uh, you know, our thoughts are with his family. But they, they put his, name, his number on the Hill House press box, number 33. And uh, so uh, shout out for, for Hill House doing that. Obviously, just one of the all-time greats. But uh, finally, Pete. I was at the surf club Friday night for a little hand new Canaan. Seems like these two always play when we have a crossover between the sec and the FCAC. And why not? Because I always say that hand is the new Canaan of the sec and new Canaan is the hand of the FCAC. New Canaan two and oh, hand Owen one having missed last week because it's game versus Sheehan got postponed and the Rams pretty much dominated this game up front. They outgained hand almost two to one, a total offense. Henry Cunning is the Rams' new QB, threw a pair of touchdown passes in the first half, and it seemed like it was going to take a comfortable lead at halftime, 14-0. Hand finally got on the board with an 11-yard touchdown run by Patch Flanagan on a fourth and inches with 30 seconds left in the half. But then Shane Schweitzer showed up, man. Pete, he was unbelievable. Instead of sitting on the eight-point lead, Lou Marinelli goes for it all, and it's picked off by Seth Schweitzer. Back into scoring position. Two plays later, Flanagan hits him wide open down the seam. And just like that, it's only a two-point game at halftime. Second half, New Canaan back to business. On the ground, they have their own legacy in Vin Cognetta. He's the last of four great brothers. And he was awesome, too, with 152 yards. And this touchdown to put New Canaan up 
21 to 12. But you get that sense that, man, you can't really, really should have been up a lot more in this game. They, they try to put the game away and going for it on fourth and short at the goal line. Cognata can't get it. Hand back down the field. Schweitzer again with a 43-yard touchdown reception. Just an absolutely ridiculous play. He just did it all for them. And uh, after some defense, Han had the ball. Chance to win the game. A game they had no business winning. And, uh, well, Dylan Murray picks off a pass, tips it, tip drill, picks off the pass, goes in the end zone. And that was that. And uh, New Cannon, glad to get out of there. Uh, Lou Marinelli, not happy with his own play call. Yeah, you know, when you get old, you make bad decisions. I made a bunch of bad decisions tonight, but but that's not to take any. I think that's a hell of a football team. I think they're they're really coming into their own. I wouldn't want to play them in a, you know in a couple of weeks. I think that uh, you know that, that kid Schweitzer, number five, if he's not one of the best receivers in the state, I don't know who is. Um, and uh, I, I think the you know the, the the new coach is doing a great job. Um, so I, I th- I'm glad we got out of here the way we did. Uh, I'm proud of the way our kids hung in there, and I had told them coming, you know, coming into it, you're gonna get, you're gonna get punched in the mouth today. You know, you're gonna be challenged, and, and it was a game to see if we had enough heart to do this. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm glad it was that close. Um, and you know, we have to go back and kind of re- evaluate the film and see, uh, so we don't make those dumb mistakes anymore. But uh, that, that, that's a good football team. Well, I've had it happen to me a bunch of times in practice. I tip a ball up and someone else steals it. I was like, there's no way I'm letting any safety or linebacker get this one. I was like, I got to take him. And then, I don't know, I saw it in the air, grabbed it, just took it to the house. I mean, it's always it's always been a dream of mine to put a game away that way. I mean, I got to give it up to my big man up front. They put some pressure on the quarterback's face, and I just finished it for them. Yeah, we knew it was going to be a prize fight, and it was. Um, and it came right down to the wire. Uh, I'm so proud of our kids. Um, you know, ultimately for us, this is adversity, and we welcome adversity. You know, adversity makes us better. Our program is built on pushing through adversity and becoming better because of it. You know, hand 0-2 start, not ideal for the Tigers who started the year. I think number three in the poll. They are now out of the poll. They, uh, you know, the week off for COVID, you know, issues uh, that cost them their week two game, a game that they probably would have won. Um, when you lose a couple in a row, it's it's hard to build that back up it's hard to okay we're going to go out and win the next one and their next one is massive yeah (laughs) so not the not the not the easiest but not you know definitely not the start that they wanted but it doesn't get easier for the for the tigers this week new cannon happy to get out of there number one lou obviously you know was proud of his kids i mean this is a this is a team that doesn't have uh, Drew Pine anymore. Remember that he, he was the quarterback for the last four years. Actually got in there in Notre Dame and led Notre Dame to a victory for all the guys out there who thought that Drew Pine couldn't play at Notre Dame. He looked pretty damn good. He was six feet. He looked awesome. Threw a touchdown. Got the game ball. And one of the games at the at the end of the one of the balls at the end of the game from Brian Kelly. It was the win that gave Brian Kelly the most wins for a coach in Notre Dame history. Um, I love seeing it. I was getting text messages from like friends who were like, oh, you're, you know, the, uh, the kid from New Canaan's uh, in Cone, Cone got hurt. I'm like driving home from Ledger and I'm like, crap. I was like, I need, I need to get home. I need to watch the end of this. And he played great. So yeah, so shout out to Drew. Yeah. Good, good job, Drew. Congratulations. That's a heck of a win. Yeah. I know her name, no, no less. That's, that's no joke, but you know, obviously this is two years later for, for New Canaan. They have some, uh, they, they look good up front. I mean, are they, uh, are they a great team? Not quite yet. I mean, there are some things they got to work out, but, you know, Cognetta, obviously, you know, it was a battle of legacy families, which was great. The surf club and overall Pete in the Alliance games, you had the SEC eight and nine. The ECC was one and two FCX five and five CCC five and five. The SWC had the only real winning record of the bunch five and three. Um, and that was all against SEC like tier three schools. But, uh, you know, showing up for uh, for the SWC, that was nice. But it was a pretty even alliance slate. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there were some that were kind of surprising. But I think um, across the board, it was there were some really good games. And I think, you know, we've had this conversation about the alliance. We like the one or two crossover games. We like to see maybe who's the best conference this year and all that. Uh, so I think one week of it's great. I think next week will be awesome. Um, but I think when you look at some of the schedules for the teams in the SEC, you kind of roll your eyes and you're like, okay, really? Like Shelton's not playing Xavier this year. All right, cool. 
yeah, those are some of the weird, weird ones. There's some, there are some games that we're, we're missing. And, uh, you know, uh, some of these games just did not move the needle. I mean, you know, you Harding going up to New Milford. I mean, who's who's going Harding going up there? You know, you have Pomp Rog. Guilford's going to Pomp Rog. Pomp Rog is going to North Haven later. And Serafford's going to North Haven, which could be a good game. But, you know, even if it is a good game, no one from North Haven cares about Stratford. They care about, you know, East Haven. They care about Lyman Hall and Sheehan and Cheshire and Amity. You know, those are the teams they care about. So I, yeah, I agree. Two, two crossovers are great. You want to bring NFA and then maybe even Newtown in the fold a bit more to give them a little bit better schedules. That's fine. But uh, maybe but make a league out of it. Somebody. I mean, this is this is other than that, we can't be playing Alliance games every other week because, you know, at some point it becomes all over. It just becomes a mess. And the other thing is it's not special anymore when you, when yeah. you have them all over the place. It's just not, it's not special. It's fun to get that one or two crossover games just to see where you stack up. Because usually that only happened during the States back in the day. Now yeah. you get that. It's fun. Then you get back into league play and you go, you go win a league championship if that even exists anymore. So they don't even, yeah. the, even the leagues that give them out, they don't mean anything. Sorry. And this is, I'm probably going to get some hate for it and be like, Oh, Pete hates league championships. Cause I said that during hockey too. Um, but I don't hate it. It's just, it doesn't really mean anything. So. Personally, I like, and I said this on Twitter, I love the way the CCC realigned. I thought that was a really interesting way. They did it by power, by size, and by roster size. They kind of added that little ranking. They're not perfect. Jason Bruin from Platt kind of get into it with me. He says he hates it because it doesn't help anybody getting to the States. The state, basically, and, that, and he's right. He's right because the state system is still based on this now becoming arcane PowerPoint system that I really don't think we need anymore. Personally, if you ask me, I think we should go to, you know, actual winning a division or winning a league somewhere and getting into state somehow. But, you know, again, like we've, we've I want, I just want to, we should go to the hockey model. Let's get a division one. Let's get all the big boys playing against each other. Right. I mean, there is some, there are, there are haves and there are have nots here. That's certainly a factor in this and size does not make a team great or not. Put all the yeah. big boys in one division, have them all make the playoffs, you know, you go seven and three, you still have a shot to win a state title because you played 10 of the best teams in the state. I'm in on that. And it wasn't just Alliance games. We're just going to quickly run down the rest of these. Some of the some great ones out there. How about Brantford beating Notre I, Dame? Nope, I, I'm over Brantford. They, uh, they have burned me many times before. <laughs> Brantford giving us the business, not talking about them. 15 to 12, David McDonald. Catches a 50-yard touchdown pass with Zach Turbert to put the Hornets up 429 remaining in the game. And Nuram had a chance to, to put that, to, to maybe win it with a Hail Mary pass. Sorry for Notre Dame, the Hail Mary prayer. Not answered. And Brantford wins that one for the first time. They were 0-12, at least. I don't think they played before the SEC came to a being. Uh, but, you know, they were 0-12 and since the SEC started. And Brantford always got their doors blown off by Notre Dame. And it was a lot of the times had a lot to do with kids who grew up in Brantford playing for Notre Dame. So that adds another little wrinkle to why Brantford was fired up. I think they basically stormed the field after that game. Well, two years ago on this show, I predicted that Brantford would win the Class M title. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> they didn't make the playoffs. So... I uh, happy for Brantford. I'm not buying into anything with Brantford right now because I, 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 that, that bridge has been burned, <laughs> but that? it was a great win for them for coach Lamone. Um, you know, you got to think, I, I said this to you. I said, Brantford being Notre Dame. I go, wow. I go, Notre Dame only scored 12 points. But, yeah. Interesting. Like it wasn't like a high scoring, like 40 something, you know, just a bad defensive day. Notre Dame scored 12 points points against Brantford that was that's a, a big eyebrow raiser that's a big tough that's a tough one that's a tough one for Notre Dame going forward and you kind of question where you know where are they whether this team's going to end up um another fascinating game from the outside the alliance was Trumbull 29 Ludlow 28 you know Trumbull didn't play last week Ludlow lost in the last seconds to Wilton I feel bad for Ludlow has been in every game they played I mean they got snake bit by Cam uh, Edwards again in uh in Norwalk but then they lose to Lola in the last second and then Trumbull. How about Corbin Smith scoring three touchdowns, including this beauty from 18 yards out from Hunter Agosti to get Trumbull within one with four and change left, running over Ludlow players. 
He's also the kicker. And when they, they flubbed the kick, the, the extra point kick to tie the game, Corbin Smith took and ran in. And that was the winning points. That was about the 245. That's your last boy. That was the winning points. How about that? Talk about being staked. That's your boy. That's your boy, Corbin yeah. Smith. He's your boy. Mars Had a great game. Up, Mars talked him up before the season, and he's certainly been a big factor in Trumbull. Uh, they're only one and one. They got a big one against uh, Shelton next week. But uh, yeah. that was a, that had his fingerprints all over it. And so did the comeback against Staples in week one. Uh, a couple other games that just kind of stuck out. NFA 28, East Line 26. NFA, another needed to hold off a two-point conversion late to win that game. East Line scored at the very end of the game. And NFA held them off. And it fits scoring two straight touchdowns in the last six minutes of the game to beat New London 12-7. And then the other one was Maloney 21, Simsbury 14, Angel Arce. 29-yard touchdown passes to Eli Gonzalez to put him up. And then there's Rayshawn Shelton with the great pickoff in the end zone. The receiver, I think it was Tommy Murphy from Simsbury. If you stacked Shelton two on top of each other, I think he would reach Murphy's height. But he went up there and just rest the ball away from, from Murphy to, to win that game basically for Maloney. That was early in the fourth quarter. So Maloney with a big win. Then Bristol Central coming through with a big win over, over uh, Weathers, undefeated Weathersfield. I said, Bristol Central has got to show up against Weatherfield. You guys are serious. Rose on the gang with a huge win over Weathersfield. That was another exciting one. But Pete, just a crazy week overall. I, I thought there was a lot of other things we could talk about. We both went to Ledger. That was fun. Nice little Saturday afternoon. Got to see Ryan Outlaw run for 300 yards and you know, four touchdowns. Uh, and that was fun to see the Outlaws in action. Yeah, he was good. He uh, he runs like Marcus. And that's yeah. that should scare a lot of ECC teams. Yeah. You know, and they got the they got the brother at quarterback and you know, like we had uh Mike Sericchio, oof, Mike Sericchio last week on the show, and uh, they are three and out, so and they're going to Lyman Hall this week. So that that should be an interesting game. But uh let's just wrap up the top ten here, Pete. You threw out your ballots, let's see where we are now. Starting off from the bottom, number 10, killingly. Uh, they defeated Lewis Mills 54 to eight. They stay at the number 10 spot. Number nine is Greenwich after losing to Shelton 35 to 14. Kind of got a mulligan here. They had a couple of big win uh, wins to start the season. Dropped to nine. They're on the edge there, though. And Greenwich has got Fairfield prep in a <laughs> suddenly massive game as far as the class double L standings go. Uh, number eight is Cheshire finally getting in there. Defeated Staples 42 to 14. Christian Russo has powered the Rams into the top 10. They, they were on, I think they were 11th last week, and now they, they deservedly get in at the, at the eight spot. Are they too low? Uh, I think they're a little low, but uh, so is this team, I think. Number seven, Shelton. Three, you know, they beat up on Greenwich 35, 14. I mean, that was impressive. And uh, the Gales at number seven, I even had them higher than that. I had him all the way at three after that that big victory. I don't know where you had him. I also I also moved them up to number three. Number six is Fairfield Prep. Oh, an iffy number six after that massive Hill House result. You know they had their big win against Hand, but now Hand's zero and two. Is Fairfield Prep ranked too high? They beat up on Connor though, twenty eight nothing. So they stay where they are. Number five, Newtown gets a mulligan uh, after losing to Darien. Tough games, twenty seven fourteen. They were right in it, but. Just couldn't hold on at the end and got overpowered by the blue wave. Number four is Southington, defeated New Britain 41 0. Number three is New Canaan, which I thought might be a little bit high for but but New Canaan name recognition, people are putting them there, defeating hand 28 18. And then finally, number two, St. Joseph, four first place votes. And then number one, Darian has a line share, 18 first place votes. Pete, what do you think of the top 10? I think a lot of people aren't looking at who these teams have beaten. And I think that is a that's something that needs to be taken into account. Um, you know, Fairfield Prep has three wins. Awesome. They they haven't played a big game yet. They snuck by Hill House in week two. Uh, Shelton has a staple win on their on their board, beating Greenwich, who was number four. I mean, they beat the number four team in the state, according to us. How are they? And if you and me voted them both in the top three. Where else are they getting votes from? Yeah. Um, you know, New Canaan, uh, they played two not good teams to start the year. And, you know, it took a little bit more to get past hand who fell out of the top 10 with their second loss. 
So now we're rewarding by moving them up. Uh, it's interesting. I, I put Ridgefield in my top 10 because I think they're that good. But the problem is, is that they lost to Greenwich. So now I have to keep Greenwich in my top 10. Not that I was going to drop Greenwich out of my top 10, right. but I couldn't put Ridgefield over Greenwich right now because they did lose to them. If that game was five minutes longer, Ridgefield wins, but it wasn't. So you can't put Ridgefield over Greenwich. I'm surprised Greenwich isn't in, uh, Ridgefield isn't in the top 10. They beat the number two. eight team and they took Greenwich down to the wire. I voted him two people. I ran into the same problem. I could not put 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 them ahead of Greenwich. You just can't do it. You can't. Not yet. If Greenwich loses this week, Richfield, you know, Richfield's got right. Newtown. You, so you beat a you beat another team, or another team beats you, then you start to look at that, especially yeah. if it's early in the year. So you can kind of start forgiving if Richfield goes on a you know seven game win streak, you can forgive yeah. that first loss. Of course. You know, as we go on. Because it's about what you did now and how the team is now. You know, you do look at the overall body of work. That's obviously a big factor in in doing poll votes. But, you know, it's not it's not scientific. This is just my thinking. But uh, if Granish Granish loses again, yeah, yeah, obviously you got to put it, especially as we go forward and Richfield keeps winning. uh, It's it's interesting. Like, you know, you look at Southington. Maloney was their best game. Um, They won it in the last minute. And then they've played two teams that they should be. And they're skyrocketing up there. You know, they don't have any Alliance games on their schedule this year. So they're going to be playing CCC opponents the whole way. And they're just going to keep rising up the pole because they're probably not going to lose a game. So, you know, you kind of like sit there and it's like, I've seen both teams. I think Rich Shields better. But, you yeah, know, that's me. Joining us again, fresh off his, uh, Experience at Newtown Darien last week. Darien wins 27-14 over uh over the, the Nighthawks. Jeff Jacobs, how you doing? Tell us all Hi, about Sean. what happened over there at uh, Darien. How was it? What was the atmosphere like? And what'd you take out of the game? Well, the atmosphere was tremendous. Uh the sh- big shout out to big ups to the Darien uh, student section. They were showing to themselves. They threw so much powder up in the air. It looked like a snowstorm over there by the end of the uh, by the end of the night uh, on the ground and everything. They they took the field after the uh, after the win. They didn't they didn't carelessly uh, charge out there and start ripping down goalposts or anything. They just kind of went out there and celebrated with the with their with their players afterwards which was tremendous and they chanted and at one point they uh, all had all held up their iPhones you know like the way they used to have matches and stuff at uh, old concerts and stuff I guess they do it in new concerts I just don't go anymore uh, <laughs> so it was a quite a show by them and and it was a and it was a solid number one performance by Darian the football team yeah you said you voted him number one to yeah. going into that right yeah. Um, you know, close early, kind of back and forth, but what event, what ultimately tipped this in Darian's favor? Okay. Uh, two things really I liked about Darian. One was they took a couple of huge punches to the mouth uh, early on and they, and they responded. Uh, they had empty defensive backfield in the first play and they went and, and uh, a new town went right over the top and, they had a, one linebacker chasing a big, uh, a fast wide receiver, and we know how that goes. So they stunned them 67 yards first play. And then the third play from scrimmage, uh, Miles Drake throws, throws an interception. So they were, uh, 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 they were in, they were in early trouble, but they responded. And that really, I really like that the way a team held its poise, didn't rattle. The other thing is, I'll tell you what, Sean, uh, the defensive line of Darian is for real. Yes, David Ivanchuk is a really good player, but he's got support there. Uh, and the offensive line was good too. So I just saw a team that just started grinding and uh, on defense just held them, uh, held Newtown to so many plays of no gain or little gain. Yes, they got stung by three big plays, but that was about it. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, Dylan Magas, who's a really good quarterback, really deft uh, for uh, Newtown. But then they start bottling him up in the second half, and he, he had no, nowhere to go. Uh, so it was one of those games, if they kept on going, the score would have gotten bigger, not tighter. 
So mm. that's why I, I said, Dylan, uh, why uh, Darian is a number one team going in and a number one team going out. It's funny uh, that you mentioned that, that, that you know, Vancey, just like his uh, older brother, you know, Mark, who was a player of the year for us and, you know, broke sack records. If he, if, uh, if his brother had, uh, you know, didn't have a COVID season taken away from him, you know, maybe, I don't know if he'd be, be chasing that mark, but uh, he certainly established himself and is living up to the to his brother's performance when he was at Darien. Yeah, David, I'll tell you what, he's a human refrigerator. He is about as wide as he is tall. He is a, <laughs> he, he is a, a human bowling ball, which speaking of human bowling balls, uh, on, uh, on offense, uh, uh, Ty Comiskey. My boy. I, I, I'll tell you what, if we have all state competitors, he's on that team for sure. Uh, he, he's a, he fumbled the ball. There was some question whether he was down when the ball went out. Uh, he had, there was a fumble at midfield in the third quarter and he came off, he takes his helmet off and he's like beating it, uh, beating his helmet with his fist and, and screaming when he, when he came off. Sure enough, in the fourth quarter, he makes up with a, with a 14 yard touchdown run that was just all effort and uh uh they they get they wear this like chain around the neck they wear it right away when you make a big play uh darius so he's like all of a sudden he's sitting there on the bench with this chain after he ran on it was it was kind of a funny uh you know it was kind of the you know the thrill of victory and agony of defeat uh, type of thing yeah but he he was a he was a i got to know him during lacrosse season and he was a big thick kid now remember he didn't play last year in football so i saw him lacrosse beat. he looked like a dump truck and he's yeah. he's winning. He's a fogo. He's on the faceoffs, and he's basically winning faceoffs just by running through guys. You know, kill the the best play I ever saw him make was he made a faceoff, and then he saw a prep kid off to the wing, and just went over there and smashed the prep kid to knock him out of the way, and then went down and started the offense. And so you were like, "Wow, this kid!" I'm like, "You play football, right?" And he's like, "Absolutely." And I'm like, "Can't wait for football season." Uh, the Miles Drake was saying he's the most competitive, most loyal kid he knows. You know, and they they're. Uh, they're going to grind it real hard. That's what I'm, you know, so I, I want to see somebody that's physical enough to, uh, uh, to be, to be able to beat Darian, especially if they clean up some, you know, like the big plays they allowed, uh, you know, St. Joe's I know is, is really talented and, and, and can, and break some, but, uh, until I see Darian get pushed around, I really like them. They're, they're, uh, they're good. No, they're coming up to your neck of the woods, right? They're going to the NFA this week. Yeah, NFA. I don't know if they're as good as uh, as we uh, as we uh, projected, and that's true with a lot of teams. You know, we, we had a lot of a lot of teams up there, and we learned a lot. Uh, I th- I saw last week as a learn a lot uh, uh, week, and uh, that's why I said I learned enough about Darianne. Like you know, we and I and I and I told all those guys, including Mike Forge, I said, you know, I voted for you, but like. There were two or three other teams I really didn't know, so you know I'm a believer now, you know, in, in, in that. So I I, uh, I like I like uh, I'm high on the blue wave, and I and I'm high on their student section. Yeah, no, that was a great effort by them. It's Darian at NFA. It's going to be the game day CT. The, the day of New London is going to be broadcasting that game, 6:30 p.m. There you go. Yeah, they can go go check them out again against the uh, NFA, which you know had to go to a wire against you know for the second straight week, so that should be tough. But, you know, just looking over at this, at the this was a really nice game. And you wrote a column a little bit last week about how, you know, this season, as great a game as that was and how we're distracted from all this stuff, we're still, we've still got a problem here in the state. And uh, not as many postponements last week uh, in, for COVID reasons. I think we, was only, we only counted five or six, um, but there were nine or so or, uh, last week. You know, your thoughts on that and maybe some other things that were, you know, that's been kind of, you know, we've been kind of missing the, this season. Yeah, I know. I, that was kind of the glory there Friday, being there, you know, soaking all that in and watching a really good game and a re- great environment. But, like, we got COVID. And they're not going – if they're not going to knock out five, six games a week, we're going to start looking at scheduling problems and playoff pictures that are that are disjointed. And uh, you got to be realistic about it. I know the CIAC is really taking a stance of, like, isn't it great that everybody's back this year and we're going to get through it. And, and, and I can appreciate that after all the, after all the, uh, so much, so many things slung at them last year that, that we're not all, uh, that we're not all pleasant the way, the way, the, the way they handled it. So they're really taking this st- a strong stance that we're going to get through it this year, this year, but Hey, playoff playoff, uh, the, 
one thing about the playoff point system is is that it's against you get a lot of uh, bonus points based on who you play. So just missing a game or two, that's not going to come out even. You know, if you you know, because some teams are going to miss games that would have been losses. Some are going to miss uh, games that would have been wins with heavy playoff points. So it's going it could stand to really be uh, uh, impacted. And uh, you know, as we go along here. We're going to see numbers of games that, you know, Avon hasn't played a game yet, for example. Uh, and we'll see. Nobody will go crazy until some of those FCX schools start missing games. Then we'll then we'll see everybody shouting like 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 nuts. But uh, uh, that's there. Also, uh, I wanted to bring up fan behavior. Uh, and I didn't I, I haven't written about this. And uh, I, I have, we haven't talked about it, but I was really upset a few weeks ago about that, that fight, in, those fights involving Hamden and Hill House. Uh, it, it was unclear exactly who all was fighting, but from some of the reports there, it was pretty nasty at times. And that really bothers me. And I know they made a decision to not let kids in without uh, adults, uh, for a while see how that goes and then they're debating that but it, upsetting upsetting is the word and then what happened with cheshire we're still trying to find out what happened mm. it, it appears that an israeli flag was put by the cheshire kids but it was part of a red white and blue ce- celebration i was told and, and the cheshire kids that put up were were jewish themselves but whether there were confederate as a confederate flag there and exactly if there were slurs thrown unclear yet but yeah. again, we live in a world that's not perfect, you know, yeah. and, and including the buses, Sean, where we now have we, we now have, have a shortage of drivers and some drivers refuse to get uh, vaccinated. And therefore, that's causing a shortage because they, you know, uh, they're holding them out. So we can't escape from the real world as much as we want to. huh? No, absolutely not. I mean, you're right about the bus shortage thing. I mean, that's a, that's an intrusion and it's something that they've been dealing with. And it's. You know, not just a sports thing, it's just a general school thing. You know, I think everyone being cooped up for so long, you think maybe that has something to do with it. You know, fans finally, I went to the Durham Fair for the first time and, you know, and that was my first big event this weekend to go see, you know, uh, people out in the open. I realized, I'm like, I haven't seen anybody in this kind of a venue. I went to a Yankees game. I think that was the only other time I'd been in a place where there was a lot of people. There have been a few fans, but I'm out in the fields uh, at some of the other games, some good crowds. But like you said, I mean, it was a nice, looked like a really nice crowd at the Darien. No issues there, thankfully. No. But uh, but certainly, like, that's been, I saw, you know, I was at Hand New Canaan, you know, where I saw Craig Semple, the Hand AD, standing in front of his kids, making sure everyone, and there was a big Hand crowd there, but making sure they were doing okay. Some kids shot off some, like, fireworks. I'm sure he was happy with that or some sort of, like, <laughs> you know, some incendiary devices. But, yeah, finally getting out after two years being cooped up, I think has a lot to do with this as well. But as far as the, you know, the cancellations go, I mean, Jeff, just as far as you know, I mean, is it a, is it a team vaccination thing or, or I mean, what is it? it, it it's, it's interesting because w- one factor that I don't know we've totally explored yet too, and, and, and coaches don't always say something, is that numbers of kids are missing and the team's still playing. Right. So uh, it, we don't know exactly how much, how many of the final scores have been impacted by players missing games uh you know uh, some teams been playing you know they make decisions when they when they when they postpone or cancel something now cancel games if they postpone the first one yeah yeah uh it's not that they don't have 11 players to play they just don't feel they have enough players to play safely uh on that so there are there are you know teams are going out that feel they do have enough players to play safely so it, the the competition's already been impacted yeah. in, in that way. So, uh, yeah, it, it sure appears that it is uh, – it's not that so many kids are getting COVID. It, it's all about contract uh, contact tracing and then going – and if kids – hey, look, it, Glenn said this straight out, Glenn Lungarini, the executive director of the CIC. If these kids, if all of them had been vaccinated, there would have been – fewer kids being held out for two weeks and it's his belief some of these games would not have been postponed if they had gotten vaccinated and you know what i got to say huzzah and bravo to the cic at one point they have been hammering home the the uh the get vaccinated thing and i know that people that don't want to get vaccinated poo poo it and people that want to like 
force everybody to vaccinate or they'll cancel all the games, think they don't go far enough. But I'm on that boat as far as like stressing it as much as possible. And you know what? I wrote a column back uh, uh, at the beginning of the year to the, all the kids directing to them. You're going to get what you pay for on on if you don't get vaccinated. And it's and it is coming to roost. Now we're going to see how much it, uh, how much is going to impact everything by the end of the year. But yeah, it no. is impacting as we're going along. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, if you're vac- if you're vaccinated and you get, you know, there's a context risk. You're not sitting out. But if you aren't vaccinated, guess what? You're out. Two weeks. Hundred percent. So you know, and that's where our problems will probably rise. We don't really know quite. Some schools, some bigger schools, might be able to survive it. But like, I think you see a lot of these smaller schools uh, being the ones that, who are who are going to have to start canceling things, and that's unfortunate. So. Jeff, thanks a lot for giving us a little time here. Great game as always. We're glad we were able to see that and get us a report there. If you didn't read Jeff's column on it, check it out. It's on GameTimeCT.com, and uh, we appreciate it, Jeff, and we'll, we'll see you next week. this week with the chip on our shoulder you know we knew these guys were used to playing spread teams and uh, you know we put in a little wildcat formation that we've been waiting to run and we just came out and we executed it tonight and we just let's go Rich the the that's the game tough football and that's just what we do man so Pete at the beginning of the season I uh, I go over one of the scrimmages and one of the coaches there was like you guys doing a uh, you doing a top 10 poll and I'm like yeah you know we gotta do it he goes why you guys, what's the point? You got to do it, you know, at least, at least one week, maybe two. And that man is Mike DeFelice, the first year, second year head coach of Shelton, who proved it to us last week by just absolutely obliterating uh, Greenwich, number four ranked Greenwich in the second half. You know, we call it an upset because Shelton wasn't ranked. But if you talk to Coach DeFelice here, he, he knew he had him all the way. Coach, welcome. I appreciate you giving us a little time. Uh, congratulations. That was a pretty big win. But, you know, I, I think your boys... I think they knew they uh, they deserved this one. Yeah, thank, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, you know, we, we went into that week and like we do every other week. And, you know, we're trying to win the football game, you know, and we're going to game plan. We're going to practice. We're going to do everything we have to do to, to try to win the football game. And the kids responded great um, to the game plan and practice. And you know, we were kind of riding them a little bit more this week or that week and saying, you know, no, you did it wrong. We got to do it again. No, you did it wrong. We got to do it again. And just kind of, you know, beat it into them. And they they responded great. So, you know, they kind of, Greenwich kind of took it to you real quickly. They, they hit you with for two long touchdown passes. And you guys got picked off in a, a shot toward the end zone, if I recall. I took, watched some of the film last night. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, at that point, it must you must have been like, you know what? Let's just see you know, our guy. We have some big boys up front. You have Matt Wiener there, who's a big kid. Yeah. And, and you guys ran the ball well against Amity at second half. Was this is kind of the same thing? It's like, you know what? It worked well last week. Let's let's try it again this week. And sure enough, 300 something yards uh, later and, and four more touchdowns. Yeah. You know, that, that first interception, uh, I wasn't too concerned about because it was fourth down and, you know, they ended up getting it on the one. So it was kind of better than a punt. Um, and then, you know, from we had our game plan in where we had some passing in and we've had we had our, you know, our beef package, our heavy package in, in our back pocket um, since the preseason. And uh, we felt like this was the week that we were really going to break it out. And we thought we could uh, surprise them a little bit with it. You know, a lot of the FCAC teams, they don't face a tight end. They don't face a, a formation like that on defense. And uh, we felt, you know, hey, we could maybe do something with that. And um if you told me beforehand that I was going to be in that formation 90% of the game, I would have been, no, definitely not. <laughs> no, we would we were going to do, we were going to run it, but you know, for that long, but it just, you know, it, everything just kind of aligned and came together. We said, Hey, if it ain't broke. Don't fix it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the first win uh, over Greenwich. I mean, you guys don't play often, but first win since 2000, I believe uh, yep. in the state since finals. Danny. Yeah, yes, Danny, exactly. and then you played in the finals a couple of years later. Um, Greenwich won that. But, you know, we talk – everyone's talking about the running, the 333 yards. Greenwich has a lot of playmakers on that team. And, you know, like Sean mentioned, burned by Barber, burned by Galetta. What did your defense do kind of from that point forward to 
you know, because if it's not Galetta, it's not Barber, it's Bab. They have so many different weapons. How did you guys lock them down? Yeah, no, we from, you know, right after the Amity game was over, we started looking, you know, and, and game planning. We went to the game, the Richfield game, and, and we were watching them. And, you know, we were very impressed. <laughs> we, we were at that game and said, wow, OK, they can they got some guys, you know, and it's not just Barber, you know, um, I, I, I thought number seven would probably their best athlete on the field. Yeah. yeah, he made a great that that catch he made was amazing. No, our guy wasn't that far off of him. Um, and we just looked at it and said, all right, we got to lock these guys down as best we can on on offense. And against Richfield, they ran the ball a lot. You know, they were they were gashing Richfield for a while. So we said, all right, well, we got to start with stopping the run. And so we kind of formulated a defense to stop the run and, you know, take away their their RPOs, which they really didn't run too many of those. Um, but we, we wanted to make sure we took away those because those could be really big plays. And we just told our corners and safeties, hey, man, we got to stay deep, you know. And the, the two touchdowns was our corner bit on a hitch and go, which we told them all week, don't do that. We'll <laughs> give them five, six yards. We don't care about that. And then the safety, the uh, they ran their double post play, and the safety got underneath it. And instead, instead of getting underneath it, he was over the top of it, which we told them all week not to. But we just really game planned and, and really, you know, hit into their heads that, these are what this is what we have to do to stop them. And if we and we were able to with having those couple extra guys in the box to take away the run to get some pressure on them, too, also, which I thought that definitely helped. You know, they weren't sitting back there and they didn't have all day to pass and shutting down their run game. They had to go to the pass. So then now we can kind of all right, we know they're passing. We can get after them a little bit um, and just keep those guys a little bit deeper and keep everything in front of us. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a football coach. I actually never played football. Um, you know, when you're five foot seven, there's really not a lot of options and you don't run a four, four. Um, there's not a lot of options for you on the field, but you know, it seems like if you win the line of scrimmage, you know, you guys, you got, you know, Sean mentioned Wiener, you got lock, another Lockovich. Yeah. Uh, you could put the quarterback on his behind. I mean, that changes everything. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the D line did a great job from, our DNs to uh, our D tackles, our linebackers, um, they just, you know, read their keys and were really able to put a lot of pressure on them. And uh, again, like really shutting down, I think they had like 40 something yards rushing. And you know, that was huge because if you can't establish, I don't, you know, obviously we were the opposite. <laughs> if you can't establish some sort of running game, you know, then it's, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to, to tee off on a team, you know, and, uh, the, the front you know six that we had up there did a, a great job of doing that, of shutting that run game down. I was really impressed with them against Amity. I know it was almost a carbon copy of the Amity. Because the Amity just maybe not at Greenwich's level as far as like their pass game goes and their, their offense yeah. goes. But you guys really shut them down. And, um, you know, I mean, talk about some of your guys. I mean, another Lakovich. We talked about it last week. Another Lakovich. You know, now it's Matt instead of like he was great. You know, he was a he was a he was a virtual first team all stare for some people. We we made him second team. We got yeah. killed for it, but you know, he was up there. He was certainly a great player. And yeah. you know, we have Matt Weiner, who's listen. He's been a even throughout the pandemic stuff. He you know he's just been one of Shelton's great athletes and yeah. a really funny kid and very deadpan like big man oh, yeah, way. Is, yeah, <laughs> I love him. He's like I don't I don't want to say any cliches here. But I, he had some great responses at the Amity game after the Amity game, and I'm like, this guy. They, when this guy speaks, people must listen to him, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. He's a funny kid. He's uh, yeah. He doesn't show a lot of emotion normally. Um, there was a couple times, you know, he, he had a fumble recovery. He made some great plays. I'm jumping around, slapping him on the head, like, oh, and he's just like, yeah, thanks, coach. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like, yeah, he's a great wrestler. He was, he was, oh he was yeah. State champion wrestler as a sophomore, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's just a great player, but the defense is really make it churning. Uh, you know, and then obviously, listen, like, the, the, like you said about the guys up front, you know, you have a guy, kid like Santiago running around back there. He seems like he's real, you know, you guys got some guys. I mean, it's just a matter of kind of making things click uh, and, and doing stuff for the offense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, it's it was hard not having last year. You know, I, I, I was talking to some other people and they like it's kind of like the, the seniors are kind of like a junior and a half. And like the sophomores are like a sophomore and a half or juniors are like a sophomore and a half because not having that year last year to, you know, especially as a sophomore and a junior, you know, you're, you're going to fumble around, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to, you know, just kind of get your feet wet a little bit and to understand the game of football. 
And those guys didn't have that last year. So we're trying to do squeeze all of that into, you know, a three, four week preseason, trying to get everything ready. So the, the first couple of weeks were almost like, you know, the, the second part of the preseason, you know, we're still trying to figure out everything. The line's still trying to gel, like what is our best defensive front, you know, all those things. It just unfortunately takes time to come together, but, you know, luckily it all came together last week. Very well. How, how, how awesome was it to see when you get out of, you know, finally get everything put away. You see Danny Orlovsky <laughs> giving Greenwich the business. And, uh, you know, quote, I, how cool is it to have him say that? On, well, on hold Twitter. on. It was quote, heard Greenwich got put on their heads by Gales football again. <laughs> Just for the record, this guy has, he has millions of followers on Twitter. Uh, not millions, but he's got 300,000 followers on Twitter. All, you know, probably following him for college football, NFL. And they're like, what is he talking about? <laughs> That's what I, when I saw it, I'm like, how many people don't know like that, you know, Shelton High is seeing that tweet. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, that, that was great. And, and actually Danny came to our youth camp that we had uh, this past June. Uh, and he spent the day here with our, with the kids. We had like 150 youth kids here. Um, and he was you know, working with the quarterbacks and stuff. So it was, a, it was a great time. And I actually gave him a hat. We, we got some new hats this year and I go oh, here, make sure this gets some air time. And I th- it was the next like day or two. He was on ESPN for something and it was there on the back on the shelf in the back where uh, he usually does his, uh, his videos from at his house. So it was nice. I, yeah. I love that. Our number one, our, that our ESPN guys from Connecticut are mostly Valley guys. Yeah. You no, know, Danny O, <laughs> Steve yeah. Coughlin, and they both show off their, their gear whenever they have a chance. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hey man, gotta be proud. <laughs> yeah, no, it's that was awesome, and uh, he's all over our Instagram page too. He like yeah. likes everything, always gives like kids <laughs> shout outs and stuff like that. They get a yeah. big kick out of it. But you know, yeah. but you talk about getting, you know, trying to figure out what the right packages are, getting comfortable, you know, kind of maybe a preseason. What you guys have coming up next, I hope you're ready because if people don't know at home, you got Trumbull, Hand, NFA, Newtown, <laughs> Prep, Cheshire. <laughs> yeah good uh, good luck that's not easy no definitely not definitely not yeah, and it's you know it's it's a grind you know it's you know yeah the the podcast name is is perfect for our schedule this year you know uh it's it's it, it's definitely going to be tough you know trumbull's big we're watching film on them they're big up front you know they um for a, a town that is literally right next to us we don't play them very often and when we do, it's usually a battle. It's usually a war because, you know, neither one of the, neither one of us wants to walk away with the loss. Um, you know, Coach Petrasi over there does a great job. He's going to have his, his guys ready. And then, yeah, we get a we get a week off because we have our bye week. But then you know, we just get into the the you know more of our SCC schedule. We got to take our you know our our three day cruise over to Norwich to uh, play NFA. <laughs> I was, I was Coach, joking. are you in the SEC? Is that, you know, I, or I, what? I think so. Yes, I think we are in the SEC. Um, but uh, yeah, I was joking with our, our new uh, uh, athletic coordinator, Scott Snell, and I said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to need a, a bus for NFA. We got to leave a little early He goes, when do you want to leave? I go Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I go, just get me, just get me a room at the casino. We'll be yeah. fine. Uh, we'll, yeah, great buffets. We'll feed the kids. You know, my dad, my dad's up there all the time. He's got plenty of points. So we'll figure it out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's rough. Um, and I, you know, and I get what they're, what they're trying to do with the, with the Alliance thing. I mean, we've kind of debated it a little bit here, but you know, and I talked to you on, on, on the, uh, on the record for a story and, you know, your take was, and I don't know if it's changed it, but you know, I, we don't mind. We'll play anybody anywhere, but you know, it'd be nice to, you know, not play every game outside of our league. And, and we'll just let you guys don't play Xavier this year, for example, which is right. always a great game. Yeah. No West Haven, no Notre Dame, or West Haven. Right. And, you know, the, the thing that I think probably the thing that bothers me the most about it is that we don't have the opportunity to, to win a league championship in the SEC. You know, and I, I'm, I could be wrong, um, but I think we're the only sport in the SEC that we don't have a regular season or some kind of tournament champion at the end of the season. Right. And, you know, it's it's that's something the kids strive for. It's something the kids want. You know, it's nice to put a banner up on the wall and say, hey, we were tier one champions or we were who's a tonic champions or whatever the, you know, the uh, division is called. And 
for us, you know, our ultimate goal, winning the States, that's really the only thing, you know, eight and two, you know, or nine and one or an undefeated season. That's a great thing. But, you know, you, you want the kids to have some, some of that recognition. You want them, Hey guys, there's a payoff for your, you know, you are the best team in the SEC and not just because, you know, Sean and Pete said so because, you know, you beat everybody else in that league yeah. or you have the best record in that league. And only one and, team can win the state championship, which is, you know, right now they're looking to go maybe six, which when you think of it from this perspective, what you're talking about makes a lot of sense. Now you at least give up some teams or something else to play for, you know, especially the SEC schools, which don't you're right. They do not have there was a, even when it was SEC Division one, two, there was no like you had your division one champ, but you weren't. What you were the one West champion. You didn't play everybody in two, so right or the wet or East, and it was just like where. So I've always thought that was missing, and you know that's kind of we kind of got a little bit away from that. That's unfortunate, but well, those games two years ago. Because I'll tell you this, I was at the hand game two years ago, the last second. Yeah, uh, I was at the Newtown game, which was a great game. Could have went either way in that game. It just seemed like you guys were in all those games. Still finished seven and three. Obviously, just missed out on the playoffs. But I, I do want to point out because I, I love. You know, it was in 19 uh, when you guys lost a hand on the final play. You're kind of – the playoffs are kind of maybe not – you know, you still got to figure out the points. And all all these Fairfield prep kids are cheering in the background because they're – because their lives are still alive. And they're like, yeah, like that helps us out so much. And and then you beat them by 30 the next week. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I remember looking at that being like, they were doing it like right on the Shelton sideline of the end zone at the surf club. And then I saw that score and I was like, oof, that was a, yeah, that was we, a good film. We all saw that. Um, <laughs> and I, and the, on the, I wasn't on the bus, but on the bus ride home, I remember afterwards talking to some of the kids and, and they like, coach, did you see all those prep kids? I'm like, yes, I did. I go, <laughs> well, we'll, we got them next week. Don't worry about it. Like, you know, don't get crazy, but we'll, yeah, there was, I think that definitely motivated the kids that week to see that because, uh, you know, they and they know a lot of the kids that go there too. Yeah. There's some Shelton kids that obviously go there, so that was uh, that was one they definitely wanted that year. <laughs> you know how how hard is it though when you you know you guys started out three and zero that year, you lost two in a row to Cheshire and Newtown again, both good games. You're going into your eighth game of the year, and it's already like you're in playoff mode because you're like, we need to win to stay alive, even yeah. if we win our next two games. Is that hard to get the kids kind of in playoff mode eight games in, you know, or do they know that everything kind of hangs in the balance? Uh, no, I think by that point of the year, uh, they kind of know it. You know, we, you know, and especially being in the double in double L, you know, there's so many good teams in double L that, you know, you trip up a little bit and you're, you're in trouble. So, you know, I think the kids, especially after the hand loss, they were just like, you know, this is it. Like we should have, we could have had that game, you know, hand played a great game. You know, that ball bounces away. I think it was Schweitzer who picked it up. Right. Yep. I think he was a sophomore. Yep. If that bounces away from him instead of towards him. The game's win. over. You know, literally yep. one bounce of the ball. And so I, our kids, I think they looked at that and said, all right, well, you know what, we're going to do everything that's in our power to make sure that we have a chance to go into the playoffs and, you know, and, you know, if we, run into someone else that, you know, we run into a Cheshire, we run into a new town that we lost to, and then, you know what, we'll be that much better prepared for them uh, in the playoffs, you know? And so it's, they were, that, that year was very e- easy to focus them up because they were hungry for it. They wanted to make the playoffs again. And that was the first year in like, I think six years or seven years that we didn't make the playoffs. So those kids were definitely really hungry for it because they didn't want to, you know, let down all the, the teams before them. They didn't want to be the, the team that didn't make it. So no mercy, no mercy is the uh, battle cry this year. That, <laughs> Shelton has their, Shelton has a, every, the last 10 years or so, Shelton's had a slogan. They put it up on the, all over the place. And this year is no mercy, yep. um, you know, and that's something you've picked up from that was from the Jeff, Roy. how is Jeff doing, you know, and uh, I saw him at your scrimmage. I haven't seen a game. I didn't, didn't see him at your game at Amity, but uh, you know, what's he been up to and how's he enjoying retirement? Uh, Jeff's doing good. <clears throat> Excuse me. I see him. You know, he teaches. So I see him uh, pretty much every day here at school. I, um, you know, I, I'll run some things by him about some stuff off of him. He's actually coaching his kids flag football team. And uh, I, I, I don't hate to report this because, you know, he, it's, it's frustrating him so much and we get a kick out of it as a coaching staff. 
Um, he has not won a game yet in his uh. football league, and he is <laughs> the winningest coach in Shelton history, and he, and he can't get together a flag football win. So <laughs> he's going to kill me for saying that, but sorry, Jeff. <laughs> well, you got to think the coaches on the other side who maybe are parents or and they're like, oh, this guy coaching a state championship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I, just, I just beat them on Sunday morning in seven on seven flags. I'm sure they're yeah. bragging at church or, the, or, at, the, or at the golf course later Sunday. Yeah, yeah I just yep. beat Shelton's uh, Jeff Roy. Yeah. Flag football. Yeah, you didn't even just awesome. say that. With the center sneak. In the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh yeah, man. But his kids like it. So that's, you know, that's why he's doing it. His boys are enjoying it. So that's why he's, he's sticking it out. You know, he's, He's liking it. He's, he, it was, uh, it was funny. It was, uh, I think it was after the, oh, that's the North Haven game. We're out and you now I'm getting a, you know, couple of text messages about this, that, and the other thing. And I'm just sitting there and I just like kind of put my head down. He's like, I know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, and I'm glad it's not me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is kind of breaking news. Do we have a breaking news button? Yeah, I was just about to say. We just got uh, we just got emailed the poll this week. Our Will Aldum calculates it for us, and uh, Shelton has now jumped up to number seven in the poll. So, congratulations wow. in your third week, you are officially in the top ten poll. Excellent, thank you guys. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, well, you even said to Sean, like maybe we shouldn't do a preseason poll. So, if this is the first poll of the season, <laughs> three weeks in, you guys are number seven. <laughs> I, I would say this is the real top ten poll right now. I mean, like. We've had we've kind of messed. I changed my entire ballot, Mike. I, mean, I, I was just like threw Whoa. mine out. I started from scratch last night. Yeah, I didn't look at my last ones. I said that's it. I don't know anything. Were there any scores uh, you were surprised at? I mean, there's some surprising results uh, this week. Um, I, you know, the, the Richfield Xavier score. Um, I, you know, I obviously cheering for the SEC. I, I thought that was going to be a closer game. Um, I thought you know that could have gone either way, but yeah, me I was too. A little, I was a little surprised that, you know, they were able to pull away that much. Um, the the Darien Newtown one, I was I thought that was going to be a little bit closer. I mean, it was pretty close, but I thought that was going to be a, you know, kind of last minute, you know, last drive kind of game, too. But. Um, you know, you never yeah. know. It, it, well, it was it last time. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Darian, I don't think wanted to get in that situation. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure they had a – I'm sure they worked on their prevent defense uh, for, for that <laughs> game because that was that was amazing. And, I, you know, when that happened, I was I was so happy for those guys in Newtown. I knew I coached over there for a couple of years. Uh, I actually coached Pat Bobby when he was – I think he was a freshman when I was coaching oh, yeah. over there. And But, like, you know, that was that was just amazing, that whole story about that. So – yeah, yeah, there was there was some some good even the you know Brantford beating Notre Dame West Ham for yep. the first time yeah. ever. Yeah, that was that was interesting too. There was so it was uh, yeah, there was there was a there was a few scores out there that were kind of you know kind of made us tilt our heads a little bit when we were going through <laughs> everything. Yeah, well, um, it's that but, kind of year, Coach. You know, I mean, oh like, yeah, everyone doesn't. It's still we're still kind of learning. I mean, sure, you know, looks like some of those the quote unquote legacy programs are, you know, maybe have a little bit more of an advantage, but even they aren't, uh, aren't, uh, you know, uh, immune to it. I mean, Notre Dame is a great, great program and Brantford biting them. That certainly just shows you that, you know, we are in, we are through the looking glass here, at least as far as, you know, this, this second season goes or this first season since last uh, goes. So, but, so it'd be really interesting. Shelton three and oh, everyone likes to see that. I know Shelton loves, uh, you know, you know, whenever we root again, whenever we pick against them, they get, yeah. they get nuts. We so. got, we were getting killed uh, on Instagram Friday night. They're like, yeah. oh, shout out to Bill Bloxham in the eight ball. They yeah. completely <laughs> forgot Maggie also picked Shelton. Yeah. But they're uh, like, Bill Bloxham, the eight ball. And now, you know, Bill, <laughs> you know, Shelton Trumbull, that's the Bill Bloxham ball. That's what I'm yeah. calling it. That's yeah. the sports editor, the Shelton yeah. and the Trumbull papers for us. That's the Bill Bloxham ball right there. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Well, that, that one's going to be interesting because uh, uh, one of our old players, Paul Piccarillo, who played for us, you know, back in you know, the early in the mid two thousands, his father is grew up with Marcy. Yeah, um, and they went to Trumbull High together, and you know, he was one of the owners of Porky's in downtown. And I was like, well, what sideline are you standing on? Uh, come to tr- come to Trumbull game, and he's like. Uh, I'll stand in the middle somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, oh, he'll stand behind 
a one, a one of the end zones right by the goalpost. Yeah, right. right exactly. <laughs> we, oh, we love Paul Pick. We love and we love Porky's. Every time we get down there, we get we like to try to, you know, help him out down there. I mean, it's been a while. I haven't been there in a few years because of the pandemic and everything. But I've definitely fixed it to go. But uh, my good luck against Trump. I know that they're going to be tough and Mars is tough. And that's always a that's a border rival. We don't rivalry. We don't get to see much. But, uh, you know, one of those benefits of the alliance, we're glad to get to get the get that happening. So uh, that's great. Mike, we jo- thanks for joining us a little bit here. And, you know, and good luck, you know, three and and you're only seven. So there's still may- way, many ways to climb here, you know, <laughs> preps ahead of you. So I'm sure there's plenty of motivation going on there, too. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we'll, we, we just take it a week at a time. We got Trumbull in our crosshairs right now. And, you know, and, uh, you know, just win week by week and everything will, will shake out in the end, hopefully. Yes, and in, enjoy that bye week because after the bye week, I oh, yeah. don't want to be you guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike, well, we appreciate it. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate Bye. it. So, Pete, Mike DeFelice, Shelton 3-0, and it's a great thing, huh? Yeah, you know, it's like one of those programs, like you, you football's more fun when Shelton's good and they're competing for, you know, a state playoff. Uh, spot their their fans are passionate their kid passionate the coaches are passionate and you know you anytime you go to a game at Finn State with something on the line that place is wild and it's really really dark there because the yeah. lights maybe aren't really that great but uh it's always a fun time when they're in the mix and uh, that win against Greenwich was awesome just you know we talked about it with Mike they're gonna have Trumbull they're gonna have a bye and then it's like five weeks of just hell. So, you know, hopefully they're ready for that. That's a long five weeks for any team. It's fun watching Shelton, you know, go through the trials and tribulations of the season. Like remember two years ago when they were waiting on the result of the uh, new, t- uh, sorry, the NFA New London game. <laughs> we had a live stream from, from Shelton High School. <laughs> you know, their reactions of how uh, that game was going on. NFA ended up winning. Shelton disappointed not getting in the playoffs, but you know, I feel for him because they certainly deserve to be in there and get another shot at Newtown. But Hey, you know, as Mike said, you got to win the games, got to win the games. You, you know, can't uh, put your, your destiny in the hands of somebody else, especially a formula. So, uh, you know, Shelton, no mercy. That's the, that's the, the clarion call here and uh, trouble coming up. You know, they've had their way with trouble in the past. So we'll have to see if Mars's Cruz has got some answers for him. I don't know. It's been kind of sketchy a little bit for the for the Eagles, but uh, that should be fascinating. <clears throat> so, Pete, uh, I, just as we, <laughs> just as I was about to kick it to you to talk about this week's game, Mike DeFleece texts us. He goes, "Darn, I should have listened to the Pickums podcast from last week before today." I don't even remember what I said on the Pickums podcast last week. We were uh, killing we him. All, we all agreed that Greenwich was probably going to win the game. So, thank God he, uh, thank God he listened after our interview with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, you know, another interesting week. I mean, we got a big Saturday. What do you think about this week coming up? We're going to know a lot. We might throw out our ballots again after next week. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, we talk prep, prep Greenwich, Ridgefield, Newtown, Hand, Massey. Uh, there are so many. Norwalk, Cheshire. I mean, Norwalk is really a very similar team to Cheshire. They both have two stud running backs. They're both 3-0. and um, they're both going to, you know, fighting. If they could go 4-0 oh to start, they're both going to be in position to make the playoffs. Yeah. And to me, they look like very similar teams. And uh, I, that's my most intriguing matchup. But, you know, maybe I'll take this as a way to segue to listen to the Pick'em's pod. We're going to have all those games on there. And me, Jeff, and Sean are going to pick them. So uh, make sure you listen the week of, not after. All right, Coach DeFelice? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> We, uh, that's where we get out. That's where we, you want to find your bolt and bomber too. That's where you're going to get it because there's plenty of it there. Believe me, we, we go on lots of limbs that, you know, the next week have cracked beneath our feet and we're like falling, you know, several stories down on the way down. So it's tight. Hey, but we just going to keep throwing ourselves out there until uh, we get some of these, some of these right. So we'll call that a podcast. Thanks for joining us for Peter Pogba. I'm Sean Patrick Bowley. This has been the Meat Grinder on Game Time CT. Love you. Thank <laughs> you.